Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Past guests include Kevin King, Michael E. Gerber, author of The E-Myth, and Howard Tai. Today, I'm speaking with Carlos Alvarez, the CEO and founder of Wizards of Ecom, and we are going to be talking a lot about building a community and a real brand. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help seven-figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Carlos, I started my business back in 2015 and grew it to an eight-figure brand in seven years. But I made a lot of mistakes along the way that made the path of getting to eight figures take a lot longer than it needed to. There were times where I had a lot of self-doubt whether I could lead a team of people or whether my brand could actually survive in the marketplace or if I could have the cash flow to continue to reinvest in new products. I wish I would have had a guide or a mentor along the way that would have helped me overcome a lot of those stumbling blocks. And so to our listeners, those of you who, who have hit similar plateaus and are looking for the next steps to take your brand to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. All you need to do is email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com and in your subject line say strategy audit, and then plead your case as to why I should choose you and your business to work with this month. Today, I am super excited to introduce you all to Carlos Alvarez. Carlos is the founder of the Wizards of Ecom, the largest Amazon meetup group in the world. He is a nine-figure Amazon Ecom seller who teaches, biz teaches businesses and entrepreneurs like you how to leverage the power of Amazon for financial freedom through free-to-attend meetup events. With that introduction, welcome to the show, Carlos. Absolutely. That's an amazing introduction. Also, to be Part of the intro with Kevin King, Howard Ty, Michael E. Gerber. We're talking about the Michael E. Gerber, like is in E-Myth Revisited, Michael E. Gerber? Yes, sir. I didn't know that episode existed. I'm going to go back and listen to it. I also didn't know I can plead my case for a strategic business audit. Like, surprise, surprise. I'm looking forward to pleading my case. There, there you go. So we're going to, this conversation is going to go on for a while. Um, and Carlos, I mean, we've, we've chatted for a while now. <laughs> I think we first... Uh, We've met, I, I originally met you at Prosper back in 2021, attended one of your workshops that you were presenting on and heard like, I have 200 VAs. And I was like, blown away. I was like, how in the world is this guy doing it? Um, I learned a lot from, you know, that class that you taught. And then I had been following your podcast um, since then. And it was a pleasure, you know, coming on your podcast earlier this year. And since then, we've been um, in touch and, you know, developing a good relationship. But Carlos, I admire everything that you've been able to do in the Amazon space and everything that you offer to the community as a whole. And, you know, I mean, that's going to be the topic of our conversation today. And I'm just curious, Carlos, why are you so passionate about like building this community of not only Amazon sellers and e-com sellers, but like, where did that stem from? I, I feel like it stemmed from the exact answer. I don't know. I, I, I want to say it had to do with trying. I'm very contrarian. So my people around me, competitors, colleagues, I'd see them doing it one way. And I, I, I felt like there was an easier way to go about it. And a, an example would be a friend of mine was, this was a bazillion years ago, it feels, was launching a mat. And I feel like a yoga mat should be same breadth as garlic, garlic press, uh, real gloves, like the thing that everyone kind of uses an example that you shouldn't launch and was struggling with it really bad. I was like, why don't you just open? And they were into yoga, by the way. And I was like, why don't you just open up a yoga studio, a whole bunch of traffic that's there. You get to build a community, you get to meet real people, to talk about and get feedback on your yoga mat. He was like, that's crazy. There's no way that I'm going to open a location and teach yoga. Um, 
that cost too much money. Like all, all those, the, you know, costing too much money for the location was the big one. And I was like, man, how much are you spending in PPC? Like how much hemorrhaged ineffective PPC are you spending? Uh, just get a little bit of that and open the location. Well, he wound up doing it and it wound up working amazing. One of the top yoga accessory brands selling on Amazon. But that's always been my way of thinking, like wanting to be around people, wanting to get feedback from real people. And, that, and then also many years ago, I heard from uh, Ryan Dice was on stage, traffic and conversion. And I was actually right on the, the verge of like joining War Room myself. And he said something about businesses. And he, so I feel like he's been phenomenal at like saying what's going to work down yeah. the road. So you really get to get ahead of it. Unlike a lot of conferences, you go there and they're telling you stuff that you should do, but you already should probably be pivoting out of that thing. And it was predicting that businesses that would really be able to succeed would do things that were not uh, so easy to track the ROI on. And mm. one of those things for me was building communities, especially in communities IRL, like in real life where you get to like build real relationships. So yeah, that, that's where I got my start from. That's, that's where it started. And since then, it's if I'm going to launch it with very few exceptions, uh, if I'm going to launch a brand, one of the first things I look for besides, is there a market for this online and can I do something better is what does a community look like for this brand? And sometimes if, if I can't answer that, does building a community look like for this, I won't launch it. Interesting. That is super interesting. Um, I have so many questions um, to ask you about, you know, creating that community, but to help our listeners kind of understand everything that you're involved in. Carlos, tell me more about, you know, you've got a lot of business ventures. You've got a podcast. You've got a lot of meetups. You're also a, a seller yourself. And so you have your own e-com brands. Tell me more about all the things that you have going on. Oh, wow. And we, we have we need two hours for that, but I'll, I'll do the I'll do the quick one on it. Um, I'm I, I have over 50 businesses. I'm obviously not fully involved in, in all of them. That would just be impossible, even with an amazing team. Uh, most of the businesses are not e-com related but they're all funded initially by, uh, by, by granddaddy Bezos, if you will. And it was just, I got suspended when I first started Amazon and I was just like, I really don't think this is going to last more than a few years. And this is 15 years ago. Uh, I need to get into something else. So I, I would get a percentage of the money I was bringing in and I would start something else. So everything from just brick and mortar coin operated laundry, it could be a dog grooming thing. It could be a salsa dance studio, uh, whatever it might be. I'd have those. I have some service-based businesses I started. So I have a lot of that going on. Amazon and selling on Amazon has always been the, the lion's share of, of my revenues and, and what I do and, and my passions. Um, I've successfully started and exited 17 brands to date. Um, wow. Let me take that back. Um, 14 of them I started and exited. Uh, the other three I was part of uh, during an exit. Uh, the last three were in a roll up at the beginning of last year, I think, before the spigot got turned off, if you will, in, in the uh, Amazon aggregator space. Yeah. Uh, the, the only brand I have left right now is my brand of live insects, which is, which is also my, my largest one. And it's also like a big shocker for most people like, wow, you could sell live insects online. <laughs> and I happily married dog, two kids trying to model how you have your life going on on the personal side. Why, why not taking my foot off the gas on the professional side? Um, the, the, the community, uh, the community seven years old, as far as the wizards of e-com community. And I'd have to say that that's my biggest passion right now. And it's free. So it's not like there's a hidden come to the back of the room, give me your 401k type of turnkey thing. To <laughs> it's free. Um, I, I feel like my motive for doing that is to grow. We were talking a little bit about before starting the podcast about like how you're not, you are an actual seller. So like having people on the show that are sellers, you might you learn some tactics from them that you can apply in your own business. So there's a lot of that going on. Podcast, Wizards of Ecom, uh, an annual event called Online Seller Cruise. And I think I... Oh, and a brand called Salsa Kings, which is uh, the number one Latin dance studio in the United States. I have business partners on that. Yeah, I think that sums it up. It's a lot. And, and I do Amazing. it all. Uh, 242 virtual assistants, an army of domestic employees. Uh, just learned early from a coach that Chris Ducker, who I don't know if you know. Uh -huh. uh, Chris, so learned early there. Just, just hire people smarter than you. And, and that's, that's what I did. Carlos, this is brilliant. Now my mind's going a million miles an hour. You, you're incredible. And I hope our listeners, like they understand the value that you have to offer in your business expertise. Guys, we are, we are talking to a nine figure Amazon e-commerce seller. Like this guy knows what he's talking about. Carlos, well, a question before we dive into the whole community thing that I have personally is 
you have over 50 different businesses. Not all of them are e-commerce businesses. My question is, how do you manage 50 different businesses? I assume you have a operator running each of those businesses for you, but still, how do you find the time to do that? I, I want to, I want to like full transparency here, say that I don't feel how I do it or what I'm doing is the correct way to do it or even a healthy way to do it. Um, uh, I also absolutely love what I do. Right. So, I mean, when I started doing this, I was a runner. Now I'm 320 pounds and you know, like it's come, I've made some, some bad choices, if you will, along the way to do this. And if I could go back, I would have gotten out of certain things earlier, probably. Um, I've also learned a lot off of touching the stove, so to speak. Mm. So I've, you get burned, you you learn from it and you you do it a little different. I I think it would have been a lot better with hindsight to uh, get a a strategy breakdown of my business and what's going on and make some decisions, uh, make some better decisions along the way. But how I do it is I'm not actively involved in all of them. I'm 100% reliant on SOPs, processes. And I would answer, I would have answered this very different a few years ago, but I, I'm a fan of, uh, if you've read a book called traction, uh, huh. Yep. Gino Wickman. And there's another book and I believe he co-authored this and, and this is how I'm going to answer this now. And, and that is, um, I believe it's rocket fuel or rocket ship or something yeah, like that. And rocket fuel. Yeah. I'm a vision. I'm a visionary. I really am. I'm a 150 million percent visionary and that clarity and being able to like raise my hand and say, Oh, that, that is actual work. And that is important. I don't have to be plugging away at these things. I hate. Um, I wish someone would have told me that a long time ago, but I'm a visionary, how I do it. I have these ideas. I, I know how to natural to me. And to me, I've always felt other people were all this way and they're, and it's just not the case. I, I know it's going to, I feel like I know really accurately what's going to happen four years from now in a specific industry. And I just, my mind just works amazingly at putting those pieces together on how to get there. And as long as I partner with people that love implementing that or the integrator, if someone's read the book, then it's actually not as hard as it seems. So like know your place, stay in your lane and, and you can soar. Yeah. I love that. One question I have is as you choose an operator, you've got to find smart people. So where, who are these smart people that you're finding? How do you find them? that you're literally trusting because you're not involved a hundred percent in many of the businesses, you're trusting them to run things on a continuous basis. You can't be involved. You can't be answering emails. You can't be troubleshooting. So how do you find those type of people that, um, that can lead those different business units for yourself? Yeah. I I wish I, if I could answer that, I would be a bazillionaire. Like (laughs) if I could tell you a one size fits all for that, I think I would be a bazillionaire. I, I don't, I don't think, you can, it would almost be saying like how to go out and find your soulmate. And, mm. and that's really what it is, but for your business. And, and, and honestly, a lot of people spend more time in their businesses and invest more of their energy in their businesses than they do their personal relationships. So it's, it, it's a very difficult thing to, to answer. I, I would say one of the first things you have to do is work on you and be okay with that. And for the majority of the time in my entrepreneurial career, if you will, I wasn't okay with that. I I needed this micromanaging thing. I felt like I needed to do it all. So read those books first, like read, read traction, read rocket fuel. If I'm getting that right, the name Read rocket fuel. And they have a breakdown in the book that you can take an assessment to figure out like who you are in this relationship. Um, Someone listening to this may need a visionary or a visionary, not an integrator. For me, I'm open to it. And I try to surround myself in circles where there's a lot of other integrators, if you will. And mm. I'm, I'm always open to like start the relationship. I'm always open to like, Hey, look, I want you to have a piece of this. I want you to have ownership here. Um, it's become very difficult. I feel like it's, it's became a lot more difficult to do virtually mm. um, than it is in person. But if we limit ourselves just to like in person, I think harder. So I, we just had one added uh, added sounds bad. Like maybe we got added to his life, but uh, named Khan. Khan's just a brilliant integrator. But Khan came into the company as running our video team, mm. which is like the most random thing. And we took a, a Gallup strength poll, which I started implementing through the, through the company. And this person came back with like four, the same four out of five as me. 
And I was like, wait a minute, like you ain't supposed to be in video. Like, let's talk. <laughs> Fascinating. I, I don't have a direct answer, like click here, push that. And this is what happens. Yeah. Well, what I did glean from that, though, is you said you're you're going and you're joining groups where a lot of integrators hang out. What are some of those groups where you're seeing a lot of integrators hang out? Um, a, a lot of like entrepreneurial communities, um, especially ones that kind of like portray themselves as like nothing but visionaries. And I found that, even though I'm not the most unique person in the world, I find that it's very hard to get a group of like 50 visionaries together. So if somebody's claiming that they're doing that in reality, there's probably 30 or 30 or 40 integrators in there that just have a, have a struggle claiming mm -hmm. them, like claiming the role of integrator. So maybe I should have worded that differently. I go to a lot of entrepreneurial events mm -hmm. um, and I, I network, I socialize with people and I, I talk about problems that I have. And if I'm talking to a visionary, they start talking about the future or they start talking about 50 things that I can implement immediately. If I'm talking yeah. to someone who's an integrator, they immediately start getting into like how that thing could be solved. Who are the people you mm. need in place to solve that? Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And I love that you're, you're being vulnerable as well as you attend these, right. And you're socializing with people and you're telling them what's really going on instead of like, dude, everything's great. I'm a nine figure seller. Like I'm just crushing it. You know, like, when you go in and you're real and you're candid with people, I think, you know, doors of opportunity certainly open up for you. Um, another thing that I gleaned from what you had talked about is that, you know, you're giving them a piece of the pie. Do you mind me asking, like, do you have a typical deal structure that you have to bring in people that are going to run things for you? Is it are they getting the majority of the business? Is it 50 50? I'm sure you have various deals out there, but. What does the most common one look like for you? Um, I've never, I've never given up more than 20% of mm -hmm. the company. I couldn't imagine doing 50% or more. Uh, I don't have a specific structure or a specific deal structure that I do for that. It's very dependent on the person, what they bring to the table, um, how we plan on working together, where the company's at. Uh, so some of the companies too that, that I have. Also, let me say, I don't have the perfect integrator in all my companies. This is something majority of my companies actually do not have one. But some of my companies are act as sort of parent companies to other smaller ones. Like I, I'm not going to have a pet grooming store that has an integrator and a visionary and a CMO and like all this other stuff. But I might have a company that controls several companies. And so, so, so it's OK. It depends on the company. Yeah. Makes makes a lot of sense. Well, you've got my juices flowing now, Carlos. Um, I, I love that. We could spend the whole conversation just talking about that and having a portfolio of businesses. Um, the one thing that I want to touch on before we move into the community aspect is you mentioned that you had made some mistakes that, you know, you would learn by touching the hot stove to stay away from it. What are some of those mistakes that you could share with our audience so that maybe some of us don't need to repeat some of those things that you've learned from? Oh, yeah, that, that's a phenomenal question. I, I think there, there, it would be great to just have podcasts dedicated to mistakes. Um, <laughs> I agree. Or maybe go through like the whole list of people we've had on the, on our respective shows and just say, we're going to do an episode on you and the mistakes you've made. But, uh, I, I've made a lot and I still make them. Uh, I, I'd say one, one of the, one of the earliest massive mistakes I've made is I, I had this business and it was actually what, what you'd call an Amazon wholesale business. And this was okay. 2009 ish. And we grew this thing to, I think it was like 16 million in sales. And at the time, mind you, I'm an elementary school dropout. I barely got my GED. I, and now you have millions of dollars circulating. And that's a key word here, like circulating uh, around in bank accounts and marketplaces that have my name on it. It got to my head and, and I, and I was a real jerk. It was like one of these people that you couldn't get around without dropping the M word, you know, million. And in reality, Every time I'd pull up to the gas station, I'd be cycling through the last four numbers of like credit cards, wondering which one wouldn't decline. And with mm. like my girlfriend of the time in the car and we were just like completely upside down, but it was very hard. You have a lot of like super experienced listeners on the show. So to them, they're probably like, yeah, of course that can happen. But when you're, when you're first starting off and you have that kind of success quickly, you don't know. And with no background in it, you don't, you're not just born with it. So business partner and I, we, 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 we clash, we need to go our separate ways. And ironically, his uncle, I think it was his uncle. He, he sat me down because I was like, I need a lawyer. 
I need a lawyer to break this up. I have a multi-million dollar business and I need help. Mm. So he sat down with me this one weekend and we're like pizza and he knows how to do this stuff. And at the end of the weekend, he says, well, the good news is you don't need a lawyer. Right. And, um, the bad news is, um, you're, you're not making any money. You're moving money. You're not making money. Mm. And I really took me, I think weeks until I could tell you what the difference between the two was. So a massive mistake there was the difference between just moving money and making money. Uh, rev, what is it? Revenues are, uh, revenues are vanity. Profits are sanity. Yeah. Um, I didn't hear that till later, but that, that's a very real thing. Uh, I pay a lot more attention to that. It seems like common sense, but it's, it's actually a lot harder said than done in my opinion. Uh, that, that was one really big mistake. Uh, another one was we, we had some products manufactured incorrectly and we went, this might even tie into the other one because we went, we're like, oh, we have $40,000 in the bank on this one situation. Let's spend $38,000 on inventory in China. No, no thought towards operating expenses. Um, our, our biggest resource that we had was we were willing to work 24 seven with energy drinks and stay up all night. So I will outwork you type of thing. Yeah. And we, we went all in on this product and we got it back and we realized when we received it, that it was, that it was patented. Oh, and then we told ourselves it's pouring rain trailer, you know, container unloads, we're tarping it. So it does, the boxes don't get wet and we have time to move it into our, when we're working out of an extra space storage unit, we have like multiple extra space storage units with fold up tables at the time. This is like early days and getting rained on. We cre you always want to crack the box open and look at one unit of each thing you brought in. Right. I don't know why yeah. that, it's almost like, when you go to the airport, walking to your gate, even though you're two hours early saying, yep, it's there. And then going to go do something else. Right. But yep. we, we did this and we realized our mistake in all honesty. And then we said, well, what's the minimum that we should sell? We can sell of this just to recoup our money back. Cause we, we were all in on this mm. instead of saying, you know, we're wrong. We need to take this as a loss. And we did it. And within two weeks we were served papers. We were sued. Um, and another lesson came out of that. I guess this will be the last one I'll, I'll try to do really quick is, we got sued. They were suing us. We were dead, dead wrong. And we got in this suit. They wanted stuff from us that we just couldn't, we couldn't come up with. So the lawyers say, whatever you do, don't talk to them. So I, I, I ignored it. I contacted the actual brand owner and I, I just told them pretty much what I told you. And I was like, I, I'm in the wrong. Like I, 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 I'm new to business. I, I want to grow and be like a business like you actually have. Yeah. Uh, I have questions I'd like to ask you. And they asked me, how many units do you have? I told them, they said, deliver it all to us. So I said, absolutely. We got U-Hauls and we drove it and we delivered it. And as the person is saying bye to us to leave, I said, what are the chances that I can open up an account with you and actually resell your products, legitimate products? He laughed and I wound up becoming the exclusive seller of that brand. The lawsuit goes away. So being able to operate under pressure was, was a big one. I love that. Carlos, those are some amazing examples. Um, and, and I love that, you know, we all paint this picture of like everything's great, but I love that through adversity, you were able to, you know, hustle your way to like making something beautiful out of something that was such a negative, um, you know, experience to begin with. Um, so many lessons that we could glean from there. Um, I'm going to ask you just for one more. Do any others come to the, the top of your mind? Because I feel like these are some of the biggest like lessons learned that I think a lot of our listeners could take away a lot of value from. Sure. Uh, th this one, I, I'm hoping every listener here does not deal with this. So my, my wife and I get married and this isn't the issue. It's good to get married. Right. So my wife and I get <laughs> married, but she she's a social butterfly. My wife is like the most amazing, loving person on earth. Right. In my opinion. Right. She has like eight, I think they're called uh, maids of honor or something like she has like eight of them. I'm a introvert e-com guy. I, I don't have that many friends, right? Like the only people I can think of are business partners. And at this time, things are imploding with business partners. And, and this is what I'm going to get to. So she, she has me just, I, I grabbed the closest people I could that were business partners. And we look at this photo that we have now. This is like this big photo. It's an important photo you get in your wedding and it shows all the groomsmen and mm -hmm. the best man and then her maid of honor and all the, I think there are other maids of honor, like the other side. And it's this perfect balance. I have been are in active lawsuits with because of like issues with the business and business partner, lack of operating agreements. 
or we don't talk anymore. And some of those people are family members of mine and, and it all started with business. So there's two books I would highly recommend um, as it pertains to this. One of them is um, uh, The Founder's Dilemma mm. uh, by, by Noah Wasserman. And the other one is Slicing Pie. And, 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 and this is sort of the, the story I'd like to paint here is my first business, my, my ex-girlfriend at the time, she had a sister and she was dating someone. And, and as that goes, the sisters like to hang out and you wind up becoming close friends with this other person. And, and he had a full ride scholarship to medical school coming up. You got to be a brain for this, right? Yeah. And drove a nice car, knew how to like do things. And I, I was very impressed with him. So I start at the time I'm working as like a, a cigar salesman at this store and I'm reselling the used goods, scratch and dents on like eBay at the time. And I feel like I'm doing good and good for me is like half my mortgage. And that's, that's amazing. And this person says, why don't you open a business? Like, okay. And I think this was like one of the first businesses I opened. And this person saw the sales double to where it's paying my mortgage. And this guy with a full ride medical scholarship said, I'd like to be your business partner. And it was such a validation for me that like, oh, the screw up, the elementary school dropout, you know, Carlos screwed up again, has someone with a full ride to be a doctor that wants to partner with me. And I was like, yeah, 50, 50 for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was most impressed that he could install a printer, you know? So like, I was like, absolutely. So what happened was I'm a visionary. I, I never run out of ideas. Yeah. And this person was in a way had a lot of integration skills going on. And you know what? Let me call it. See, it's hard to give him a compliment even to this day. He's an integrator, but just because someone's an integrator and you're a visionary does not mean you guys are a good match. So I kept saying, having these ideas and he kept saying, you need to open a business. So I'd open a business. And what do I do as part of the business without even reaching out to him? 50, 50, you're my mm. business partner, 50, 50. And then we started getting other business partners and you're like, okay, well, what do we put on LinkedIn? I'm the CEO. And it'll just, you start tossing out these C-level roles yeah. in the company. But what happens is if you have a good idea and you know what you're doing, the, guess what happens? The business might succeed. And when the business succeeds and you need to start taking on investments and getting loans and, and bringing people in that know what they're doing. And they're like, why is this clown your CFO? And you're like, okay, we'll, we'll fix that. We'll fix that. So what do you do? You just move him to some other C-level role that he's not qualified for because he's your, he's your friend. And, or you have the stones to go and say, Hey man, you're no longer having any C, C role. We're, we're still going to party over ribs and brainstorm and you're still part of the business, but that never gets received. Well, it, it's like an ego hit. So yeah. an operating agreement, um, not just tossing out these C rolls cause you think you need to fill them and being clear as to who is responsible for what mm. could have saved me. I could have had a lot more friendships, a lot more contact with certain members of my family. I would have had businesses that didn't have to go under. They went under because they succeeded, not because of a bad idea. Um, I, I would, I would caution people listening to this to like, you see yourself on that path or in the path, sit down with your business partner or would be business partner, ask them to read or listen to the founder's dilemma and put something on the calendar and say, Hey, in two weeks, we're going to, we're going to get to this. If you're not a fast reader, you can listen to it. If they're not willing to do that, or if they, Oh, I already read that. Oh, I, I read the whatever on, if they're not willing to do that, that is a very good indicator that you should not be business partners with this person and, yeah. and talk about this, break it down, protect yourself, set your business up for success, save some equity. Um, that would be my other story to share. I hope that's relevant. Uh, but just top of mind for me. Yeah. I think that's, that's super relevant. And I think it goes back to when I asked you the question, like, how do you partner and what percentage of equity are you giving to people? Now? I think in hindsight, that's why you say, Hey, nobody has more than 20% of the business. And I think you've well, learned I, your lessons. I thought you were saying that in reference to just integrators, not just other partners. Well, just in general, like, is that something that you've learned? Like the way you structure your deals now, I'm sure is because of all of the learnings that you've gone through. Right. And you reference those books as well. Yeah. Now I will not have a business and I'm not saying you shouldn't have business partners, but I will not have a business partner outside of my wife, um, which at the end of the day, that is the number one mastermind and business partner you have. So like outside of my wife, I will not have a business partner unless they are like a patent attorney or like some kind of brilliant engineer <laughs> that could like bring some products to life affordably rapidly that I can't do myself. If it's outside of that, I'll hire it. Mm, why is that? Um, just so many bad experiences with business partners and learning so many, like having a business partner to do something and they didn't really do it. And they're like in the Bahamas 
with their girlfriend and it's Christmas day and I'm in the office slaving away and I wind up having to do, I have having to get good at what they were doing anyway. Uh, I, I just said, you know what? I ain't going to do this anymore. I know how to do this stuff. I shouldn't be do be doing some of it, but I do know enough of it to get it hired. I do know how to hire a manager to watch that. I do know yeah. what you should be able to yield at X experience level. Yeah. Makes, makes a lot of sense. So you've learned through the school of hard knocks um, to get where you are today. And I think that's the most important thing is that when our listeners, when you go through difficult times, see these as opportunities to learn from and to grow from. You only fail when you quit. And that's what I love about your story here. You didn't you you talked about your journey when in 2009 with the wholesale business, you're figuratively crushing it with 16 million in revenue. But then in, in all reality, that that wasn't the case. Your story didn't end there with just like, well, apparently I was stupid. So then I left the e-commerce space and just started working at McDonald's. Right. Like, I love that. It was like, no, then I found something else. Then I learned from that. And then I learned from that. And then I learned from that. And here's where I am today. So I love that aspect about your journey, Carlos. Now, let's dive into some real meat and potatoes of what I think you're an expert in, and that is building a community. And I'm curious with our listeners that are seven figure sellers that want to grow and scale to eight figures and beyond. Why is community important in terms of building a brand? Well, with, with, with CP, a bazillion reasons. But one of the ones that I think every listener would agree with here is cost per click in ads is not going anywhere but up and it's going to continue to go up. Whereas so, so having a community, um, I don't think it should be looked at as cold blooded as that to start, but having a community is going to really protect you from a lot of that. Um, having a community is going to allow you to pre-sell products, which is like something that not enough people talk about. It's going to be able to give you direction as to what products you should get into. It's going to allow you to look at products that you wouldn't otherwise be able to, like going back to that, to that yoga mat example. Um, I, I have... I hear a lot of people talk about, I'm not going to get into that product. It's too competitive. If I can build a community around that product, there, that's no such thing as that. <laughs> There's mm. a, if you're relying on PPC for ranking something, I'm just going to use Amazon as an example. Um, there is no such thing as too competitive if I can build a community around it because I'm going to be able to sell it to my community at full price. I'm going to be able to get all my reviews. I'm going to be able to do all of that without the cost that it's going to take a PPC. So like, it's like, it's almost, there's no such thing. So you almost be, your brand almost becomes like eight feet tall and bulletproof in that sense of yeah. a community. Um, the one thing I will say is I know I can build communities. I've done them for several different brands, different, different categories. Um, what I don't know how to do, and I really wouldn't even encourage someone to do build a community when you're not genuinely into the thing that you're selling and the brand that you have. Um, mm. I, I'm not saying you can't do it. It's just not speaking to like how I do things. So I, I don't want to, sit here and say, like, just create a Facebook group, have your VA put inspirational Confucius quotes on Canva and post them automatically every Tuesday. Like that's not a community. Yeah. Um, I, I'm also not saying that you can't have a Facebook group. My communities have been in person and I chose that because I believe it's the one that the majority of my competitors will not do. For sure. They will not do it. It turns into this, how many hours do I have to spend and I have to go where? What if only two people show up? Like, you know, in the beginning, it's all that. Like, you're not willing to put yourself out there. Um, it has this flywheel effect, though. So most of my competitors won't do it. So that's where I want to be. Yeah, I, I think that's a very true point. Everybody's worried about, you know, the overseas sellers are just undercutting me and it's a race to the bottom in prices. Yeah, that can be true. But at the end of the day, if you have a brand and a following and a community that you're talking about, like you mentioned, that's where you start to become bulletproof. So, Carlos, with your experience, let's say I'm on board. I understand I need to have a community, but where in the world do I begin? I think it's going to depend on the category is. So maybe like if we had an example product or like an example something, I don't know if you had one or if I just randomly. Let's let's do uh, let's do planners. Can we do planners? We could do planners. Yeah, absolutely. Let's yeah. let's do that. And we didn't rehearse this at all. So this is no, like, we didn't. This is off the cuff. Yeah, this <laughs> putting, is off the cuff. Putting Carlos on the spot. So, so I, I look at that immediately and I'm just like talking out loud here. I'm like, OK, a planner. If somebody has a planner, um, that means they're organized. Maybe they're into uh, time efficiency. Um, 
So I'm like, okay, what is the things going on right now that can give people quick wins? If, if you're going to bring someone into your community and maybe that's going to be an event, bright, that could be a meetup. Meetup has done phenomenal for me, but it, I, I use meetup as an example so much that I think I don't want someone to be confused that it has to be meetup.com. It's just the cheapest one. It has a built-in audience and it's local. So you're, you're going to get people. You don't need people to fly to your meetup event. Um, and I would say right now, what are the things that if I'm in, since I'm into planners, I actually am. What are the, what are the things that I'm also into regarding this? Like, why do I want a planner that brings up for me, like automation that to me, that taps into the one right now. And this is the one I would probably go with on the first event would be AI. Like mm. what are, I would probably go to chat GPT and say, give me five meetup event topics that incorporate, um, AI into planning into planners and spit that out. And that would probably be my event titles. Then I would get feedback from the actual community that's there. And a mistake I think people make is they, they subscribe to like survey monkey or they get like a Google form and they put it out there with like five or six questions. And they're like, answer these so we can grow the group. And, and that usually falls very flat. Mm -hmm. um, but what people love to do, especially in communities is they love to tell you why your idea is bad. And, so if like, if I want feedback from people on when, what time I think we should meet, if I put that out there in a survey for future events, I'm probably going to get nothing, especially early in the group. But if I say, Hey, I think it's a great idea. We're going to start meeting at 8 30 AM on Saturdays. Everyone will jump in as to why 8 30 on Saturdays is bad. <laughs> what time would actually be much better. And you get an actual conversation going on in your community. And at the end of the day, you actually get real feedback as to when you should really meet. So mm. I, I would, I would do that to start. Um, if, if I only had one planner, I probably would not do a giveaway of that planner because in communities, you do not need to do giveaways. You don't need to give your product away to be there. They're into this thing that you do and you have, you can sell it to them full price, but I also don't want to sell right out the gate. So, so what I would give is I'd give some kind of, uh, some kind of freemium, something that I can give someone, whether it's a loom video, whether it's a printout or something. And I would then I would go in and again, and I'd ask for the feedback from the group and, and get them to, you know, what other topics they're interested in. Um, by planner, you do mean something that's like planning your day, um, getting organized with your day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like a daily planner. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd let the group know, Hey, I use something called task rabbit that allows me to get more done during my day by getting pretty much local VAs or local help mm. to be able to do the things that I, I'm not qualified to do, or I just keep putting off and don't get done. Um, and I'd say you, you guys interested in getting together and all putting together the best task rabbit freelancers we've used. And we sort of create this group, uh, power page on how to get help for anything we need around our local area, whether it's standing in line or whatever. So I'd create the community around that. And then I would look for local events that support the thing. That's the main topic of our group. And I'd say, you guys want, it doesn't have to be my event. And I think it's important not to, because throwing an event's a big deal, but like, Hey, yeah. you guys want to go to this together. Hmm. That's how I would approach it. How many people do you get that originally joined that first meetup group? Right. And like what, like how large of a community are you talking about building? So I'll use a one that I started for dog shedding, which no longer exists. It, it was a dog shedding tool. And that was kind of like my, Hey, I want to create a community around dogs and pets and pet owners. Another one around scuba. And then I'll use the, the one that I always talk about now, which is wizards of Ecom community. So we're talking okay. about three different ones. Every single one of them started with four people on the first event, three people plus me Four. Mm. there were several of the meetup events between the first one and the 10th one where I was the only one. And I would take a picture of myself and like kind of like on purpose, accidentally catch some people in the table behind me <laughs> and then say, look forward to seeing everybody at the next, uh, at, at the next event. And it's implying that there was more people there because no one yep. wants to go if it's just you and them and then you guys have to talk. Yeah. So it, it implies that the, the scuba one wound up growing. This is local pre COVID. There was no zoom on meetup. So th this yeah. was all local. The, the scuba one grew to a little over 5,000 members. Wow. Locally. The pet huh? One grew to right. The pet one grew to like 1600 members. The wizards of Ecom one, we've exceeded 50,000. Wow. Um, and, and that's central Florida down that they're not yeah. all active, but, but a large percentage are. And, and it's important to note here. If you have a thousand people in a Facebook group and a thousand people locally, the, the a thousand people locally is like the equivalent of 50,000 on a virtual group. It, it's got a much more powerful impact to it. These are people yeah. that know each other. They're building real relationships together. 
uh, it's a totally different ball game. How long did it take you to build up to 5,000 people in your scuba group, 1,600 in your pet group? Uh, it took the scuba one to get to that number. I'm going to say two years. Yeah. I'm going to say it took two years. It could be two and a half. Uh, the pet one, the pet one was rapid. We just started hitting, uh, uh, uh dog parks, mm. we hit dog parks. And we got, you know, two people that had local, uh, grooming places yeah. and we paid them for their time. And we just had them do free de sheddings like right there in the park to, to join the group. And then the, the, the wizards of Ecom one, that's, I mean, that's been going on for seven years. Fascinating. And with that, how often were you meeting? So the, the scuba one started at once a month. It quickly went to once a week. Uh, the pet one was once a week. And Wizards of Ecom started with once a month. A couple months in, it went to once a week. Now it's, I think we have 25 events per month. Wow. Uh, but we have a physical location in Miami. We have a physical location to meet in Tampa. Chapters in LA, San Diego, Orange County, and soon Orlando. So that one's spreading way beyond local, uh, which is something that could totally have been done with the other groups had I not exited. Fascinating. This is a uh, this is super exciting. Now, with the scuba in the pet group, then, like, what was the purpose of those like meetups? What what were the people doing on a weekly basis? Was it just to get together and and chat? about scuba or was it more like, Hey, I'm bringing in a speaker or I've got a topic that I'm presenting on. Um, like what was it that continued to drive people that want to show up weekly? Well, scuba, scuba classes one, so people could become scuba certified. And that was actually okay. super easy. It was just going to people who actually do that and saying, Hey, I have an audience. You don't know how to get people. Mm. I have people that want to get this. Like let's, let's marry the two. The other one was what were the reasons and that people wanted to get into scuba. Um, a really big one was underwater photography. So getting into the gear that's involved with underwater photography, having people to come in and share, this is where I went. If you ever go here, do this, mm -hmm. um, was, was a really hot topic. Uh, and you didn't need to like with the wizards of Ecom, I got to plan out. There might be a PowerPoint presentation. I got to know everything that we're going to do for the entire time that we're there. But with the pets and with the scuba, the conversation just runs away. Mm. Uh, everyone is really wanting to geek out and talk about this with other people that are just as passionate about it as them. And they all start sharing experiences and, you know, not a single scuba event went by without somebody mentioning a shark experience or like uh, underwater fire coral. And we live in Miami, so it's a phenomenal place to actually dive. So yeah, that, those are the topics, but you're never, I never, I never started a group that I didn't have a fear that I wouldn't have a topic for every week, but mm. There's a tool called answer the public, which I haven't got, I heard Neil Patel purchased. Yeah. Um, I haven't gone back to it since he's purchased it, not because of any reason, but if you go there for any topic whatsoever, you could come up with two meetup topics a week for yeah. a year. No problem. So that that's never an issue. That was even an issue for me with starting the podcast. I don't know if it was for you. It was like, what am I going to talk about every week? Right. <laughs> but, but in reality, it's, yeah. it's so easy to get queued up so far in advance yeah. on these topics that you have to rein yourself in to make sure you're catching time sensitive uh, stuff in your niche. So true. So true. Carlos, this has been an amazing conversation We're we got to wrap things up here, but is there anything else that you would like to add on that we haven't necessarily talked about or touched on in regards to building the community? Um, I, I would share a quick story as to like how I used community to actually get into my first brick and mortar retail stores. Um, so I would, go to farmer's markets to advertise my products and the, at the farmer's markets, it's, it's really hard to get people to um, stop and hang out at your booth. But when you're bringing your own community locally, even if it's like four or five people, when you first start, that changes everything. Mm. So I would have at this time when I was doing a candied bacon brand, um, I, I was having people come and sample this candied bacon and, and do, use the short code, like text the word pig to six, nine, nine, two, two. And they'd, They'd get on a list and, I, and I'm doing that right there. And one day somebody who had frequented the, the farmer's market came to me and said, you know something? I went to my local store and they, you're, you're not going to believe this. They didn't even carry your product. Of course they didn't. Like I wasn't in any stores <laughs> and, and I, 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 I was immediately like, really? What store was that? Like, who, who do I need to go talk to? She tells me and she goes, but you know what? I told them that I wanted to order it. They went online and they placed the order. And they told me they'd let me know when it's in the store. And I was like, 
well, they're, how are they? Um, gonna, I'm thinking to myself, like, how in the world are they going to get this? Right. So they never contacted me. I never got in the store, but she kept going back. And she said, finally, she speaks to someone because at this point she's, she's furious that she keeps getting, you know, drug, <laughs> drug like this. And, and they told her that, you know, not enough people are interested in this product for us to carry it. And so I was like, well, I have a community. And at this time we were at like a few hundred people. I was like, how many people yeah. do I need to send in this store to ask for this product <laughs> for there to be enough interest? It wound up being under 30. I wind up getting a, a, a reach out on my website. They contacted me and I wound up getting in the, the local store. And that really set off getting into brick and mortar, big box retail stores. But it started there from the experience of my community going in and asking, why don't you carry this product? I'd like to buy it. Carlos, that is such an amazing example. Um, I absolutely love that. I just love that throughout all these stories that you've shared, you just got this like hustle grind, like I'm going to make stuff happen um, mentality. And, you know, I think our listeners, I hope you've paid attention to what Carlos has shared. And I would definitely recommend you go follow him on his podcast. He has so much knowledge to share. Um, I've got a million ideas flowing through my mind right now, Carlos. So Thank you for all of that. Now, as we wrap up, I love to leave the listeners with three actionable takeaways from each episode. Carlos, here are the three takeaways that I noted. Let me know if you think I'm missing anything. Number one, I'm going to go back to the very first mistake and experience that you shared, which was that wholesale business. $16 million sounds like you're crushing it, but revenue is vanity and profit is sanity. And so my number one takeaway and action item for all of you is Get really good at reviewing your books and understanding all the levers that drive profitability in your business. And if you're not doing that, and if you don't have a financial monthly review with your bookkeeper, you need to implement that ASAP because you can keep growing the business and thinking that you're killing it when in reality, sometimes you're just funding and moving money around and you're losing money. So that's action item number one. Action item number two is going in with uh, the recommendations that you had for the Founder's Dilemma book, as well as the Slicing Pie book. I think that this is so crucial. So many people just jump into a business relationship or it's something new just because it sounds good. And you're not thinking what happens if this business does start to crush it in five years. And what my recommendation here is, is get very clear with the roles and responsibilities before you partner with somebody, make sure you have ironed out what are my KPIs, what are your KPIs, what are you overseeing, what, are, what am I overseeing? Make sure there's a clear delineation. In addition to that, I think one of the most important things that you can do is have an exit strategy already in place so that you could say, hey, if this relationship doesn't go the way we want it to, what are the options for us to, for either of us to pull the ripcord and to exit on mutual terms where we've already gone in and there's not going to be any bad blood, so to speak. So that would be action item number two. Action item number three would be to build a local community. I think this flies against everything, that especially a lot of the e-commerce entrepreneurs are listening to. So we're all digital marketers. We're thinking about Facebook groups. We're thinking about all the things we can do online. The One of the biggest difference makers would be actually implementing a physical in-person local meetup group. And you shared numerous examples of how powerful that can be. And I think, you know, many of our listeners, imagine if you had 5,000 local people that loved your niche and your products that you could like, that is as powerful. Like you mentioned, a thousand people locally is as powerful as, you know, maybe 50,000, 5,000 people in a Facebook group. So Carlos, is there anything else that you would add as, as a takeaway? Oh, that's, that's perfect. Awesome. All right, Carlos. Well, let's ask you my favorite three questions to ask every guest. Number one, what's been the most influential book that you've read and why? I mean, it's hard to do one, but I will. So picking one is going to be Blue Ocean Strategy. It's how I approach private label. If I can't be in that blue ocean. I, I'm not going to launch something in a red ocean. Yeah, that is a fantastic recommendation. Question number two, what's your favorite productivity tool or software that you've been using that you feel like is a game changer? I'm going to say Headspace. Um, uh, it's doing as many businesses as I do and, and trying to keep my pedal to the metal and trying to also be world's best husband, world's best dad. The transition between one to the other 
headspace coupled with a business journal is, is, uh, allows me to switch hats. Uh, so that's the number one thing in my life is I, I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better, dad. and yeah. that, that helps me. It's all about that, that focus and yeah, headspace, a great way to kind of visualize and meditate and, you know, actually realize and put the most important thing first and to help prioritize echo everything you talked about there. Final question here is who is somebody that you admire or respect the most in the e-commerce space that other people should be following and why I'm going to say Jeff Cohen. Um, Jeff Cohen uh, used to be with seller labs. Uh, now, now he's working at Amazon came up there. Uh, Jeff over the years, I've known him forever. Um, we actually didn't actually meet though. I think and known each other personally for six years now and just any opportunity that someone has to go speak to Jeff. I highly recommend doing it. He's a wealth of information on the digital marketing side, the family side, just the way his mind works. So uh, I, I admire him more than I'd say that's my influencer in the space, if you will. Like that's my go to if I, if I have an issue and need to solve something. Uh, Jeff Cohen. I love it. He, he is very well known and I echo that as well. Now, Carlos, if people want to follow your journey, they want to learn more about you, ask you further questions. Where can they find you? Anywhere on social media uh, at Wizards of Ecom. Uh, we have a Telegram chat, too. If you're if you want to talk Amazon or e-commerce, it's a free Telegram chat at Wizards of Ecom dot com slash chat. And most people don't do this, but my phone number that you can actually use is three zero five nine zero two one two eight three. I suggest texting before just calling. But if you text me, we'll probably jump on a call and it's me answering. There's no automation, anything like that. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I call BS on some of the stuff I'm saying or tell me how you why you don't think it'll work. It's all good. I love that. Look at this. He's giving you your his personal cell phone number, dropping so much value today. Well, Carlos, thank you so much for your time. And I appreciate all the knowledge you've shared with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.